Hello again, I'm Thomas Herlin and this is the second video in a two-part series on planning that I'm doing in collaboration with Paul Cockcroft. In this second part I'll be talking about the computational aspects of planning and as before there will be a Q&A section after this between me and Paul and with that said on to the presentation. So part two which is all about how. So first of all we need to know a couple of things. We need to know what people want which is the vector of demand. We need to know how to make these things and how to transport them which are what's known as the technical coefficients. We also need to know the environmental constraints and any other constraints and those these other constraints may come from the political system, for example. From these, we can assemble the system matrix S and a vector D. And what we do then is form the system of inequalities X times X greater than or equal to D. And this X that we're looking for is the plan. So <clears throat> we can ask ourselves, uh, well, what do these S, X, and D look like? So first of all, D is a vector of demand of goods and services at specific locations. So on the right here, we can see the demand for apples in Stockholm, the demand for apples in Berlin. We can also see a demand for carbon dioxide, which is negative. And this is the way we can formulate externalities. And the reason for having a negative sign is because we want a less than or equal um, inequality for these things. Finally, we have a bunch of zeros and these are there only for non-negativity constraints. So they're there because we cannot use negative amounts of labor in any industries. Next up we have X and X here contains the amount of labor employed in specific production methods at specific locations. So the amount of labor employed growing apples in Stockholm or apples in Berlin or transporting things from Stockholm to Berlin or from Berlin to Stockholm. It's possible to also encode time in uh, X. Um, and in this case we would have then the amount of labor employed in all these places for different planning periods. But I don't do this in this example because it would be, uh, yeah, make, just make it much too complicated. Finally, we have S, and S consists of a bunch of columns, one per production method, and each row is how much is produced and consumed for each of these uh, methods. Um, and this includes externalities. So we can also notice that S is quite sparse. It has a lot of zeros in it and this is important for computational reasons which I will get to later. So if we put all these three together it looks like this and this will typically have a whole bunch of solutions to it. Um, we're often looking for a solution that fulfills all these constraints but are also optimal in some fashion. And the way to deal with these kinds of systems is by using what's called linear programming. And this is a, a tool invented sort of in parallel by Leonid Kantorovich in the USSR and George Danzig in the USA. And in linear programming you're minimizing what's called an objective function, which is a linear combination of the variables in X and uh, which in this case is shown by a scalar product between a constant vector c and x. Um, and this minimization is subject to the, the constraints mentioned earlier. And any, any x that is, does, does not violate any constraint is called a feasible point. And if they also minimize this uh, objective function then they are also optimal points. So this feasibility is key to why planning can deal with the climate situation. And it's the optimization bit that's more of a bonus. So um, if we, for example, minimize carbon dioxide, then we will re reverse global warming faster 
whereas if we minimize labor instead, we can get a shorter work week. And from this, we can see that these two are in a sort of a, a dialectical relationship. They're in, in tension with each other. And if we try to reduce either of them too much, we eventually get to a situation which is infeasible, which would be a qualitatively different situation compared to just having a, you know, do a heavy a, a 20 hour or a 24 hour work week, for example. That's a, a, just a, a quantitative uh, difference. So, how do we solve these kinds of systems then? And there are basically two methods. So, the oldest one is the simplex method. Um, so, if we look at the, let's see, I get my mouse pointer there. Uh, if we look at this polygon, this represents some linear program, a system of linear inequalities that we're wanting to solve. And in simplex, we move from the corners uh, well, between corners, we go from here to there to there and to there. And this met method of moving between the corners of this polygon will eventually find the optimal solution. Um, but it can be quite slow for large systems, it turns out. Um, so instead, what's done for large systems is what's known as the interior point methods of which there are many. So here we move from, we start somewhere inside the polygon and then through various methods, we, we sort of move towards the optimum. Um, but a limitation of interior point methods is that they are approximate. So uh, they're quite fast, but you might only get a, a say a 99% solution. But for our purposes, 99%, that's, that's perfectly fine. So uh, how, how large systems can we solve them on actually existing hardware? And the estimate I have is 23 billion variables. So that would be 23 billion production methods. And this is using part of the local Kebnekaise cluster, using what's called a predictor corrector method, which I'm not gonna go into what that is, but the main point is this is a 99% solution and we can do it in reasonable amount of time. Um, and I also don't really assume any structure on this S matrix. And this is just using a single central solver, basically. So, uh, and by no structure, I mean, on the right here, we can see uh, a plot of the, the sparsity pattern of such a matrix where each blue pixel is a non-zero value. And as we can see, they are randomly distributed. And we can also see that we have an identity matrix here. So we have a, a bunch of values on the diagonal and these are just for the non-negativity constraints. A uh, consequence of this lack of structure is that there will be a lot of communication along rows and columns in the cluster. So the, the structure of S affects the structure of the solver. So, uh, but this is a very, very simple model for an, uh, such a system matrix. Uh, a more realistic model might include some kind of geographical clustering uh, we're still wanting, we still expect S to be sparsely connected. And just for comparison, we might want to have it the same density as this uh, random S matrix shown on the previous slide. Uh, and for solver technical reasons, we also want to group variables in, uh, in some way relating to this geographical clustering. And this, uh, the point of that would be to minimize the amount of communication in the solver. So the model that I came up with looks like this. On the right, we can see a bunch of points uh, that are randomly positioned on land. And I've made them biased towards the equator. Um, I've also made it so that they connect to each other. So each dot is a workplace and they connect to another workplace with probability proportional or inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So each such connection is a non-zero in the S matrix. I've also grouped them geographically, and that's what the colors mean here. 
and this affects the position of these the corresponding variables in the matrix which I will show now so on the right we can see the resulting matrix from from this kind of clustering and we can see that it is quite structured and again it, it has the same number of, of dots in it as the the S matrix I showed earlier but we can clearly see that there's kind of three different regions so we have the diagonal blocks which is what I call the intraplan region we have the off diagonal blocks which I call the mesoplan region so those are the, the red uh, points and finally we have the teal points which I call the interplan region so uh, this kind of clustering uh, makes it easier for the solver to do its thing. I also mentioned decentralization and it's important here to keep sort of the concepts separated so when people say something like central planning um, it's a bit difficult because you don't know what exactly they mean is being centralized. Uh, is for example the state being centralized or a uh, state meaning information of course uh, you know is everything in a global database do we how do we collect data can we use something like IPFS maybe um, we also have the the structure of the economy itself so do we have a lot of huge industrial centers and then like nothing in between or or is it more sort of spread out uh, in the physical world we also have the structure of the political system so is power sort of centralized in a single uh, organ or is it more sort of localized and all of these things affect the structure of the solver itself so um, there's a couple of ways we can sort of structure the solver so the simplest case is to just have a, a, a single central solver just a single Borg cube of computers that does everything we could also have a bunch of redundant solvers so we have a couple of large computer centers and all of these would then compute the same system of equations and then we can sort of cross check their different solutions to make sure that everyone is arriving at the same plan it might be possible also to have a, a more distributed solver but this requires that the economy itself is quite loosely coupled and this turns out to be very tricky because loose coupling is very hard so um, if you do the loose coupling incorrectly you may get instabilities in the economy and an example of this is the market economy which has something called the business cycle and this is a, an emergent property this kind of boom and bust cycle is an emergent property of the loose coupling used in markets so it's very important to get if we do a distributed way here we need to get this coupling done correctly uh, so that's very hard but experimentation is needed um, yeah next point here has to do with non-linearities and an actually existing economy will have things like economies of scale um, another thing to consider is things like startup costs so the fact that say a steel mill doesn't turn on a dime uh, heating everything up uh, or letting it cool is a process that may take days or perhaps weeks and this has to be taken into account in the planning system and one way to do this is by using what's called mixed integer programming and in this what we do is that we let a subset of the variables in x be integers so they can only be like 0 1 2 3 and um, this makes the system much harder to solve uh, so for solving these mixed integer programs we have uh, two groups of solvers we have branch and bound solvers and we again have interior point methods and i won't go into these uh, I just mentioned that we have two sort of rough groups of solvers uh, but really we only need to do better than capitalism where once we've been able to formulate the economy as, as a mathematical program then we can make sure that it's always in feasibility 
unlike capitalism at the moment with the climate situation is is very clearly outside of the feasible region so we we want to bring it into feasibility and only then can we start worrying about uh, optimization my final point is on computing values and the need for computing values arises because we were still using remuneration in lower stage communism so people are still being paid a wage even if that wage is in labor vouchers and since we're optimizing on labor it makes sense to value things in labor and to price things in labor and this we we do with what's called vertically integrated values which is just the the total amount of labor that goes into a product uh, not just the direct labor but through the entire production chain and this leads to a system of equations shown in the slide here l transpose equals v transpose times the identity matrix minus a matrix a and uh, v here is the the uh, vector of uh, values that we're looking for and l is the amount of labor directly added uh, in each industry and A here is what's called an input-output matrix. And we can compute this by disentangling the S matrix uh, shown earlier. And this is something that David Zakaria is working on. But once we have A, we can solve it iteratively using the Jacobi method. And I just show an example on the bottom. You know, we assume a very pessimistic uh, spectral radius of A and uh, the same iteration time that I have for the um, estimates for the size of the linear programs we can solve. So I, I've computed an estimate of nine seconds per iteration. And if we want a 99% solution, which is again perfectly fine, then we expect this to take 11 minutes, which is you know, not so bad. So in summary, Linear planning with 23 billion variables seems very possible. We might be able to have a decentralized solver, uh, but this depends very much on the structure of the economy. We can deal with non-linearities in the economy uh, by using something that's called mixed integer programming, or we could say mixed integer planning. And finally, computing values is, is, is nearly trivial. So, you know, that's, that's, that's not what I am very concerned with, let's say. And again, my, my contact information. Um, so it's easiest to get a hold of me on IRC, as usual. Um, yeah, questions? In your account of things, you talk about uh, an S matrix. Yes. Now, where did you get the term s matrix from because it what you're using in that seems to be what most marxist economists call the a matrix was it deliberately a different letter to indicate that you're talking about something different or is it just happens to use a different letter uh, it's because i want to get away from input output planning because input output planning you cannot uh, you cannot have multiple ways of producing things. I put the A matrix, so in the first post where I, I started doing this, I have the input-output matrix as part of my kind of model. And I'm like, well, I can't call the whole matrix A. That's this, you know, yeah. and that's, you know, S for system. Could you explain to people why interior point methods are more important, are an important advance over what was available before right so uh, one of the reasons is because uh, simplex uh, has exponential complexity for certain problems so you can show this is it can get for certain tricky problems it can get exponential but also it's it's more of a practical reason so i, I was using what's it called uh, lp solve for this stuff and i want to see okay how big can i go with this and I, I was going up to like 30,000 variables or something. It was starting to, to get impractically slow. It's mostly mo mo motivated by that and also this theoretic bound. Mm -hmm. And also when I realized that, well, you know, you don't actually need the, you don't need a perfect solution. Uh, and I 
uh, go and read the literature like okay people have thought about this and mm -hmm. you know if i only want it to within 99 percent you, you can do this in a in a relatively quick amount of time so it's it's more for for practical purposes it has been said that although it was demonstrated in the 50s that the simplex method is exponential in the worst case in practice people say that it in practice appears to be polynomial for most practical problems and lp solve my estimates of it is it's roughly um n to the three in time yes i think i got something like that and it ended up being even though it's polynomial is still not really practical it's, it's too high a polynomial yeah the, the, the next thing's concerned with what you've actually been able to demonstrate um what have you actually run the experiments on the cluster not yet so i would need an allocation for this and i would need a reasonably decent model for you know we, we want decent results for for such a run uh, so that's also why i worked on a model here to to get something that's a little bit more realistic um but even the random model yeah. that's going to be kind of a lower bound so it's probably what, good one method that i have thought of or which I, i've actually done on a small scale is to start off with a known input output table yeah and then systematically randomly choose a row and a column a row and the corresponding column split them into two with a certain amount of pruning a certain probability of the uh, elements being zero after you've split it to, to, to get a fractal distribution of links. Uh, so you start off with something you know is realistic, the actual input output table for Sweden, for example, yeah. and then recursively decompose it into larger and larger tables. Right, that could work. Because uh, then you get, get something that's a bit closer to to reality but the main point is that it's as far as i can tell it's io bound so i all yeah. i'm doing mostly what i'm doing is i'm calculating on the um, uh, on the capacity of the links if you're io bound wouldn't you be better to do it on a is there a single multiprocessor with a huge amount of memory yes you have the large memory nodes as well in kebnekaise we have nodes that are three terabytes of RAM and even that is I mean you can make a substantially large large system that way I, I don't actually know how, how big can we make them we I haven't checked what the currently available hardware is sort of what's I didn't know that you got things as big as five terabytes of RAM yeah that's, that's, I've never come across a machine that big no and they, they have 20 of them so yeah. this is Thomas in post I recently checked and there are currently motherboards that support up to 12 terabytes of memory. I would have thought it's worth your while exploring whether you get a better performance on one machine with a lot of RAM or on a distributed pattern. So I did think about the single machine thing and I came to the conclusion that at least with three terabytes it's not enough to, you're still doing better uh, you can have a bigger system in total with the current like 400 nodes but you could also get away with like four large memory nodes or something but it, you get a little bit smaller system you get like 5 billion instead of 23 billion this is Thomas in post I recently talked to a colleague at the university Alp Jurtsevet he does semi-definite programming with on the order of a billion variables. So linear programming of this scale definitely seems plausible with existing hardware. Could you just explain to people who haven't worked on this practically themselves before, why you think uh, optimizing, lab so solving for labor values is a much easier problem? Right. Well, the reason is that you, you only have to do a single system solve. You, you can use the Jacobi method. I mean, it, it's not, it's basically because of uh, the properties of the input output table, you're, you always converge. Yes. Uh, yes. And you converge 
well, we say linearly in, in this, but in monetary terms, you converge exponentially, you know, you get... Negative exponential, yes. Yeah, yeah, but in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in high-performance computing, uh, you call this linear, because you want quadratic, it would be even better. But, I mean, you can do it quickly enough. It's, it's, it's a path well-traveled, let's say. Yes, I, I'd agree with that. I had a online seminar, um, symposium with a bunch of Austrian economists last weekend. Um, me and Philip Daprich, I don't know if you know him. Uh, I've emailed him, actually. Yeah. Uh, and what struck me is that they're, they're woefully ignorant about the practical problems of solving these kinds of equations, grossly overestimate how difficult they are. Um, but also they keep on saying, oh, there's no alternative to money as a method of local price calculation, whereas even von Mises admitted that labor time was an alternative, but he said that's too difficult to calculate. I mean, they, they have shift the goalpost all, all the time. They're like they, they, they would say, oh, no, you can't solve a system of a thousand variables. That's impossible. It would take yeah. hundreds of years and then computers come along or machines called computers instead of yes. human computers. Yes. Uh, and they're like, oh, well, you know, you can't gather the data. And then it's, we have internet now. It's like, well, you know, oh, it's about entrepreneurship. It's like, well, you know, you make people able to directly get their hands on the system. It's like, yeah. well, yeah. And they're, they're, because, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it strikes me it's constantly shifting goalposts and setting up for themselves things which they say will be impossible which a few years later are done yeah. like hayek saying oh you'll never be able to replace shipping clerks with their specialist knowledge uh, and who relies on a shipping clerk rather than a computerized system now yeah no it's ridiculous i mean and even i mean it's funny that a lot of these computer science problems like the the traveling salesman problem for example stems from exactly that and it, and it's it's industry wanting to do this stuff. Yes, yes. So I have an, a number of colleagues who are paid money by industry to try and improve the traveling sale, get good approximate solutions to the traveling salesman's problem for yes. actual delivery systems. Let's get those greetings out onto a tray. Nice. Okay. But first, let's check out that coffee. Oop, spit a little there. That's fine. Mm, that's a nice dark roast, freshly ground in my little train mug. All right, with that, let's check out those greetings. All right, Asher scapegoat. Hakim, Luna Oi, Non Compete, Röda Stjärnan, Bookcafé Angbet, Victor Magarinho, Well, there's your problem, Hugh Gottnick, Second Thought, Steve1989, and Sibcom. Nice, okay. Well, that's the end of the video. I hope you liked it, and I'll be coming back at you with something new, or old. Nice. Okay. <laughs>